Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. Um, before I kick off, I'd sort of like to introduce myself a bit and take on three perceptions that I've heard about the social investment unit or about social investment. Um, and ask you a question before I start, and hopefully we'll get onto that at questions at the end. So, um, my name's Ed Montague. I'm the lead of investments at the Social Investment Unit. The Social Investment Unit is a new feature on the horizon here in Wellington. Um, and we're really keen now to start exploring how the methodologies and, and, and anal analysis that we're producing can be actually made much more applicable and available and used more broadly in this system of social services. Um, First acknowledgement, my background um, before joining the Social Investment Unit was at Treasury uh, and at PwC. And prior to that, I worked in a range of commercial and investment organisations in the UK. I came to these beautiful shores in 2010. So acknowledgement number one is um, a perception that what is an accountant doing here telling us how to uh, run effective social services? And it's often been said of Treasury, it's a bunch of, um, what's the expression? Grey white men in grey suits giving beige policy advice. So I'll take that one first. Um, the second one is that social investment's got a lot of um, myth around it. What is it? What is it? What is it not? Um, and a lot of it's, I got accused of doing this in the Wellington echo chamber, which I think will resonate with some of you here today. You know, there's a lot of Wellington centricity um, about this. So I'd like to put that as a second acknowledgement. Um, and the third is a, actually really a question for you, and I think I heard that reflected in some of the questions this morning, which is how can we use what I'm about to describe to you to better um, inform not just discussions about what works for whom, but actually to help improve the way that government contracts for, delivers, and partners with agencies to deliver effective social services for communities. So there you go, three acknowledgements. Um, now, this is kind of against the spirit of what I just said, but the first slide I have to show you is a disclaimer. <laughs> the reason I have to show you a disclaimer is because of the New Zealand Stats Act. And what that means is, in undertaking the analysis that we do, we um, and our analysts have access to private and sensitive information of New Zealanders. And we have to acknowledge and be highly sensitive to the privilege that that access gives them and the inherent risks that that has with it. So this disclaimer basically says, what I'm about to show you has been derived from private and sensitive information. So it's right that we, we have this disclaimer on anything that uses this information. So first, the first thing I've been asked here to do today is kind of help to demystify what is social investment. The first point we want to make is that social investment is about people. It is not about government agencies. And this will come through all the way through the presentation. The unit of analysis that we have is people. The way we think about success or failure is with reference to people. The way that we think about um, impact is with reference to people's lives, not with reference to what organisation spends what dollars. And social investment is about understanding whether the public services that all the different parts of government are procuring, whether those services are delivering to New Zealanders the right results, both for those individuals and for the country as a whole. And let me go into that in a, in, in a bit of detail. By results, we do not mean, and this is the first, another myth I think about social investment I want to spell, we do not mean less dollars. We do not mean less expenditure. Good does not look like less money. What we mean by results, and I'll go into more detail on this, is, is three domains of, of information. We talk about individuals' well-being, and this is very difficult to measure. And historically, it's been the hardest thing to actually have an, an assessment about whether the things that we're doing in government actually make a difference to people's well-being. The second area is um, private economic well-being. Right? So, you know, again, the, the, the sort of the accountancy alarm bells are ringing when we talk about private economic well-being. But what we're talking about here is stability in people's lives. And the third area of impact is actually on people <laughs> accessing government services. And so this is the, the F word, the fiscal word. And here we see um, a, a whole range of interactions with, with government services. And they can be both emergency services, like corrections, like ambulances, there can also be very positive government services, 
so universal services like education and health, where access to those services is a good thing, and spending more money in those areas can be indicative of a very good result from government. The second point I'd like to make on this slide is about the word understanding. <coughs> so it's about understanding where the public service is. This is not, social investment is not anecdotal. It is analytical. And so when we talk about understanding, what we're looking at here is an analytical and evidential-based approach to understanding what works for New Zealanders. And the third point I'd like to make is about what the term investment means. Again, investment sends send those accountancy alarm bells ringing. Um, investment here means trying to understand what impact decisions today have across a long time frame. And that's, and that's why the term investment is used. So it's social because it's very broad, it's across both our communities and individuals. It's not one agency, it's across a whole bunch of agencies. It's investment because we're looking at a long time frame and trying to understand the nature and impact of our decisions today across, a, across people's lives and intergenerationally. And it's about a broad set of results. Um, so the social investment unit has been set up. We're a very new feature on the landscape. We, I don't think we're officially called the social investment unit yet. I think we're still something like the social sector investment change program. <laughs> so you'll see why we changed our name. Um, but we are, we've been set up to embed, this is the terminology, embed a social investment system, not just in government, but also across our social, um, you know, across social services and also into, into our communities. Our starting point for that has been Wellington, and I'll acknowledge you know, what I said at the start about the Wellington Echo Chamber, you know, we, but that's where we've started. And so you know, the discussions that we want to have as a result of engagement like this today, but also increasingly in the future, is when we start to put our heads above the parapet a bit and you know, take, take, start taking it on the chin. Is, is to actually say, how can we take these concepts and this analysis and start to integrate them much more broadly? But we are agency neutral. We don't report to any one part of the social system. We don't report to health or MSD, criminal justice or welfare. Um, we report to something called the Social Sector Board. Now, that board is uh, a group of the chief executives of all the social sector agencies. So we are, and we're, and we're, we're currently paid for by all of them. Um, but we have been set up to deliver the tools and infrastructure that are required to complete the sort of analysis that I'll give you a, a bit of an insight into now. So our challenge is to move from what we've termed an issues-driven decision framework, where basically we produce evidence because it's the hot topic of the day and it's the next thing we need to respond to is to move from that to a person-centric, evidence-based framework. So let me go through that slowly. Person-centric, evidence-based. So another way we put that is what works for whom? What works for whom? And the evidence we look at is um, with regard to a very broad set of outcomes. So when we talk about impact, we talk about outcomes. And those are the ways that we measure the effect that government services are having. And those outcomes are across those three broad domains that I talked about first. Well-being, stable lives, economic prosperity, and government services. <coughs> so those are the fiscal, individual, and social indicators. This is our brand. Uh, we spend a lot of time on this. Uh, government agencies get a lot of flack for spending money on brands. I understand that. But this is important to us, because what we've got here is something where we have a Situation top left, where the beehive dictates what government agencies at the top right do, and that those siloed government agencies direct their decisions, their policies, their expenditure down into the communities or the individuals that they're told to serve. That's, the, that's what we see the old world as. We want the new world on the bottom right, where the individuals, the communities, are at the heart of government decision making where decisions are made with reference to the evidence and analysis that we know about what's working for whom, where, and that there is a singular focus on those communities and individuals in directing government resources. So what are we, the SIU, doing, the Social Investment Unit? What are we doing? Uh, we're doing a bunch of things. Um, those things are um, what our starting point for the tools and infrastructure that we think we need to develop this analytical and evidential system. 
Um, we're preparing some social investment guidance. We're very pleased that our website will be launching at uh, the end of October, beginning of November. Um, we've, we're consulting at the moment on, on, on that guidance um, from NGOs. So I can probably see some in the room today who we have consulted with. Uh, a bit of feedback I quite liked was, this is the antidote to insomnia. So uh, thank you for that for timely feedback. Um, but we're also doing, um, as well as trying to lift general capability, we're also trying to lead from the front and show that this analysis can be done and it's powerful. And I'll take you through some of it today. So this first example of this is what we're calling the social housing test case. So what we've done in this is ask, what impact on people's lives does giving them a social house have? And by life, by what impact on their lives, we've looked, we've tried to look across those three broad domains. And I'll put my hand up and acknowledge the hardest bit to get into is individual well-being. Actual measures of individual well-being. It's easier to measure the dollars, it's difficult to measure well-being. So we want to use this project as a way of advancing that debate. There's a lot of contention about what is a good way of measuring well-being. The normal response has been to hide behind a rock and not do it. And I want to acknowledge that but from government. The normal response has been to hide behind a rock and not get into that. So we want to get into that. Uh, the second area, we've, so we, we've, we've finished that analytical test case now. The results of that are being integrated into current policy development. Um, when is appropriate, we'll release all of that information to the public, including how we've done it, all the analytical code, everything. Um, so the approach we want to take as well is inherently transparent. The second area we're getting into is uh, mental health and addictions. Now, um, we're doing this in partnership with the Ministry of Health. Um, I'll get into in the presentation how we're approaching that, what questions we're asking. Um, and I hope it will resonate with some of you, um, the approach that we're taking there. Um, we're also developing, we're using this, we can use this analysis in a number of ways. One of it is to actually support the commissioning models. So obviously the Ministry of Health has got a commissioning framework for mental health, commissioning framework for disability support services. We've got Oranga Tamariki, which is trying to develop a commissioning framework. We've obviously got Fana Order, which is a commissioning, which has three commissioning agencies. We've got place-based initiatives. There's a whole range of commissioning models that are being advanced in New Zealand. Now, the question is, how well do those commissioning models reflect the lives that we're trying to improve? How well are we able to actually bring in what matters to who, where, to change the way that government buys services? And our starting point is that there's a lot of work we can do to actually start bringing together the experience and knowledge of the NGO community to bring it together with the an analysis that we can drive in our behind closed doors, you know, and actually start to bring the world together, asking what works for whom, where, and what is the best way to try and deliver that. Um, we also recognise that it's not just the ambition, there's also uh, some technical issues, some really significant technical issues, like how data can flow up and down the system. So what we're looking is new ways of actually delivering that uh, infrastructure to allow what is private and sensitive information to flow up and down the system. Um, so let me just show you a video before we get onto this. Okay. So what we've got here is just three government agencies, health, education, and we've called it welfare. And what we see is that people interact with those agencies all over the place. Now the way government records the information of those interactions is in silos. And it's very different. And it's different by DHB. And it's different by the Ministry of Health. And it's different in MSD. And it's different in courts and corrections. So the stats are built on integrated data infrastructure. And what that sounds boring, but what it actually enables us to do is to start to build person-level pictures about the entire interactions of those individuals with government. This is where the disclaimer was needed. And what we start to do is we can build a picture of how individuals interact with the whole of government by, by bringing those data sets together. Now this can sound big brothery. Yeah. Yeah. It can sound big brothery. But what we're doing is bringing together data sets that exist in government administrative organisations with, with, right, with the right level of um, anonymity around that data 
to start to try and weave together a picture about how individuals interact with government. And that's not just with one part of government, but it's telling the picture of people's lives. So when we talk about um, mental health and addictions, often the, the, the approach has been previously to ask, at the point of service, who gets what? When someone goes to a GP, who gets what? When someone goes, is admitted under the Mental Health and Addictions Act, what do they get in hospital? What we don't talk about, what we don't see, is the social determinants of that. And what we don't have and what we don't see is the social outcomes associated with that. Gareth's pointing five minutes at me. Um, so when we build this picture together, we, we actually start to see something pretty um, amazing, I think, in, in the way that we see the total interaction of people with government. On the left there, we don't talk about um, how much money the Ministry of Health gets or how much money MSD gets. We're talking about the $50 billion that we spend on social services. But in the middle is how we carve that out in Parliament to single agencies. So we spend $16 billion down through the Ministry of Health. Um, the dark green bars are how much of that money we can account for on an individual basis. So we can account for about two-thirds of it. 33 billion out of the 50 billion. It's what we can see. We can see the impact of that money on people's lives. It's not just about government spend. I've said this before, and I really want to reiterate this. Um, it is about how the impact of government services influence people's lives in a multi-dimensional way. So fiscal, economic, and social indicators are highly important. I'll, I'll move through this because I haven't got time. I want to, I want to have, allow enough time for questions, if that's OK. Um, what this is showing is that when we, so what, what we're doing is we're building statistical models, essentially. And we're trying to match uh, individuals who have received a treatment against those who haven't received a treatment, against individuals who've been um, given an intervention and those who haven't. In the social housing test case, we looked at 14,500 individuals who had received a social house in 2005-06, against 14,500 individuals matched, matched pairs, who hadn't received the same social house. And we asked the question, how do their lives differ after they've got a social house? What do we see? So this terminology, return on investment, again, accountancy alarm bells ringing. So we spend, the government spent money on income-related rent subsidy, and it spent money on providing that social house, the capital cost of that house. That's the investment on the right. On the left is the analysis we see. So this is six years' worth of what benefit do people's, the, the, farmhouse, the families get from being provided a house. And this is just the, the centre bit. This is just the government picture. So we see a few things. We see corrections spend going down. If you get a house, you're less likely to go back into corrections, whether it's remand, high prison, uh, community service, or home detention. There is a positive impact on your uh, association with the correction system. We see some very other interesting results, though. We see education spend go up. And what that means is that kids, 14 to 17 year olds, in social houses are spending more time in education, significantly more time. So that's an example where increased government spend is a really good thing. We're seeing health spend go up. What's that indicative of? It's indicative of people accessing the services that they're entitled to. So what, what we don't show with health and education is the positive repercussions of that increased expenditure. We don't show the positive benefits of education. We don't show the, the increase in years of um, healthy lives. We don't show the beneficial impact on people's families that that accessing of health expenditure has. So those are examples where, again, this is not all about the dollars. Good here is shown in higher dollars. And then we see some other quite big impacts. We see um, MSD spend going down. Now, that is the cost of accommodation supplement. It's quite obvious, you know. You give people a social house, we don't have to give them other emergency benefits. However, we see um, IR stuff, so IR spending, that's um, inland revenue spending go up. Now, that is pensions. It's um, student loans and it's other entitlements that are actually symptomatic of much more stable, healthy lives. 
So here we've got a multi-directional impact that we're seeing. It's not as simple as boiling it down to a single return on investment figure. Here we've got some really powerful analysis that says that social housing creates a number of goods, really worthwhile community goods that it's worth government spending money on. Um, but this, those are just averages. These are called bee swarms. Um, what it's saying is that, that that impact is so different depending on who you are, on who your family is, on where you are, on your family circumstances and makeup. Now we can try and build in as many different ways of segmenting it down to the individual, to the similar types of people as we can. In this example, we used about 30 variables. Um, again, the language of variables about people's lives doesn't resonate, I understand that. But what we're seeing here is that the blue dots to the right are indicative of improved circumstance for those groups of individuals. But then we've got others right down the other end who are not seeing the same positive impact in this particular area of spend. So we have to ask ourselves, in a, in a policy sense, what do we need to do for individuals? And how can we use this information to actually start developing policies that work for individuals, not just universally, trying to get the best average settings? Actually, how do we use this analysis to try and get really granular about what's working for whom where? Because I want to get onto the mental health test case we're undertaking now. And this is, I think, a really important <coughs> Um, example for how the analysis that we can do at the centre needs to meet with your experience as NGOs, your experience of working with people to actually tell us whether the results that we see in the numbers um, are reflective of real lives, but more importantly, what we can do about it. You know, in social services, I'd never get up the front gate of most houses, and I fully acknowledge that. So this is about opening up the conversation about how can we collaborate and bring the power of this analysis to match the power of your experience. So in mental health and addictions, we see, we saw last year, 2015, over 100,000 people turn up for the first time in primary or secondary specialist care. And um, that is a big number in and of itself. Um, now, what we want to ask is how many people actually were able to access appropriate care at the right time. So we're asking how many people turned up in personal or social distress versus how many people turned up and were managed by their primary health care system. Now obviously there are you know, differences but we're using this to try and get a sense of how big is the problem in terms of the provision of adequate mental health services for those who need it in New Zealand currently. And what we're seeing is that about across the average population, about 9% of people turn up in personal or social distress. They turn up for the first time in specialist care. And that's a high number. But the inequality between different types of people in New Zealand is staggering. So Māori and Pacifica, Māori are 21% of people who turn, up, who turn up in 2015 for the first time, turn up in distress. In Pacifica, it was 18%. In the European and other population, it was just around 7%. So what you're getting to is a system that doesn't treat people equally. And what we're trying to use our analysis to do is say, what are the costs of that inequality across those domains of um, private well-being, private economic ability, and, and government services? Because what we're seeing now is, because we can take this whole picture, the spillover costs of looking at things from a silo, from looking at things from a health perspective or an MSD perspective or a criminal justice perspective, is we don't pick up all the social determinants or the social outcomes of not providing an adequate response. And we start to actually make that meaningful at central government levels. So rather than this being the Minister of Health problem, you know, the Minister of Health doesn't have enough money to treat the 105,000 people, <coughs> DHBs therefore don't get enough money, therefore there are some people who don't get services. This starts to become all of government's problem. So this is now a corrections problem. This is now a MSD problem. This is now an education problem. And that is a far more powerful way to approach these issues that do not fit well in the buckets that our government institutions are defined by. So um, these, these slides will be available for you afterwards. I'd, I'd rather have time for questions rather than go through them now. These are the hypotheses we're looking at. Um, this is a question about collaboration, and I was thinking about this last night. 
this is, again, this sort of part of our branding, but it still describes a very linear central government relationship. And what it doesn't have, and I really want to, to get your reflections on this, is how can we collaborate, what's appropriate to collaborate, in order to get that positive co-design, the interaction that we need, to ensure that the analytics correspond to reality, and to ensure that what you want to do in communities, we can effectively contract for and price and all that sort of fiscal stuff that we need to do. And the two need to come together. So if it's okay, I'll turn over to questions now. Thanks, Ian.